On August 27, 1987, in Lower Plenty, a suburb of Melbourne in Victoria, Australia, a man would break into a family home at 4 a.m. He made entry through a window he broke open with a brick. He was wearing an open-faced dark blue balaclava, blue jeans, and a brown tweed sports coat over a blue waterproof zip-up jacket, and he was carrying a gray cloth bag. He was armed with a large hunting knife and a small handgun. After coming in through the window, he would head to the bedroom of the two adults living in the home. He said to them, quote, Be quiet and don't move, or I'll hurt someone. All I want is money, food, and clothes. How much money is in the house? End quote. He was able to subdue the adults and make them lie on their stomach while he tied their hands and feet, using knots commonly tied by sailors or those familiar with securing loads. He then gagged them and put surgical tape over their eyes before locking them in the bedroom closet. He found their six-year-old son in the bedroom. He blindfolded, gagged, and tied the boy to the bed before he would eventually make his way to the 11-year-old daughter's room, his sole purpose for breaking in. This would be the first of the four canonical sexual assaults attributed to the man that would become known as Mr. Cruel. And as we would see in this first assault, he was in no hurry. He would remain there for two hours in the house. He was so calm that between the sexual assaults, he took a break to make himself a meal. He would also end up rummaging through the home, finding a box of classical records and a dark blue parka coat with a fake fur collar and $250. He would end up taking all this. It was actions like these that the police would say he was, quote, cool and cruel, end quote, giving him his infamous moniker. He would also stop during the assault to make a phone call where he threatened another family with physical violence. The victim stated she overheard Mr. Cruel warn the person on the phone to move their children or they would end up in danger too. Then he called the person a quote, bozo, end quote. But this phone call, well, it was faked, as police would check phone records for calls to reveal none were made. Mr. Cruel had cut the phone lines upon entering the home. Of course, the young girl had no way of knowing this. Before leaving, he would make the girl brush her teeth and bathe, destroying the DNA evidence in the process, as well as collecting and taking all the pieces of broken glass that shattered when he hit the window with a brick. All of these head games and meticulous cleaning of the victim, these were signs of things to come. This would also be the only case where the balaclava was mostly open as well, as the area from his upper lip to his hairline was visible, except for a thin type of material that ran across his eyes that acted as some type of visor. Still, this would lead to the best image we have of the perp. He was around 5 foot 8 and in his 30s, although later cases would say he sounded like he was a late teen or early 20s. He had a slim build with brown hair. He also had some scruffy facial hair, like he hadn't shaved in a day or two. After this, he would always enter with his face completely covered with two small eye slits, blocking any potential description for the man. Early investigations into the invasion didn't have much to go on. Detective Inspector Val Simpson would tell a local paper that the attack was similar to three sexual assaults that occurred in December of 1985. Just a few weeks later, though, police would revise this and state that they knew of at least five attacks that were similar prior to this. But that's just about all that police could come up with. The only other theory was that the family had been featured in a newspaper article a few days prior with a picture of the family. They thought it was here that Mr. Cruel first saw his victim. It was also reported after this invasion that an 11-year-old neighbor of the first victim started having her clothes stolen from the clothesline. Long believed to have been Mr. Cruel as well. Just over a year later, on December 27, 1988, he would strike again, this time in Ringwood. He would break into the family home through the back door at around 6 a.m. He would then burst into the bedroom of John and Julie Wills and put a gun to Mr. Wills' temple. He also carried a knife, gray bag, and torch. This time he wore a black balaclava with white and possibly red stitching around the eyes and mouth holes. He also wore dark blue overalls, like those that might be worn by a mechanic or painter. He told Mrs. Wills to stop screaming and asked the father if he was going to try and be a hero. He forced the couple to lie face down on their bed and then tied them with copper wire and took $35. He then took a pair of pliers and cut the telephone cable and went into the bedroom where their 10-year-old daughter was with her sisters. He then walked up to her and said her name, which he possibly knew because a newspaper ran a story about her family six months prior when their house had caught fire. 
The young girl pretended to be asleep, but Mr. Cruel made her get up. He would then take some clothes of the girl and let her out. Once they got to the back porch, the girl would begin to scream. He would shove a ball gag into her mouth, but he took it out later after she agreed not to scream anymore. He told her he wasn't going to hurt her, he just wanted ransom money. He then blindfolded her before putting her in the passenger side floor and driving off. He was in the house a total of 8 minutes. While it took the wheels 15 minutes to struggle free, before they rushed into their daughter's bedroom to see one of their girls was missing. The frightened parents ran next door to call the police. As for their daughter, she would get taken back to Mr. Cruel's hidden location. Her eyes would be covered the entire time, so she never knew where she was. She would be sexually assaulted just like the first victim. She said he occasionally spoke gruff, but was mostly quiet spoken. He gave her a glass of milk and a Vegemite sandwich and later some lemonade. She would be leashed to the bed before he left the room. She would later pull her eye mask up to peek when he was gone. She would see a wooden tripod set up for filming near the end of the bed. He had apparently been recording or taking photo shots of the entire event. And just like the first victim, he would force her to brush her teeth and bathe again before taking her away. He even made her clip her fingernails and toenails. He also made her stand in a large plastic garbage bag, which he pulled up and taped to her shoulders, then put another bag over her head and taped it to her body before cutting a small hole out for the face. He then took the victim to the car, and it had problems starting. It was then that he said to her, quote, Stolen vehicles do not always start properly, end quote which is more than likely just another red herring. He would eventually drop her off at a local high school, remove the blindfold and the garbage bags, and told her to go to a nearby convenience store. He warned her not to look at him as he left. And 18 hours after the break-in occurred, a woman would find the girl standing on the street corner just after midnight. She was wearing one of the shirts he had stolen from their home. She would state, quote, A man left me here and told me to go and ring home. End quote. The woman would call police, and she was quickly reunited with her family. Upon talking to investigators, she would tell them that the man drove her around for a while before taking her to a house or a flat and assaulting her. Law enforcement would launch an investigation, and they would discover that prior to the abduction, a prowler had been lurking Hillcrest Avenue where the family lived. While another witness claimed a month and a half before, two boys were playing on vacant land close to the Wills residence when they interrupted a strange man filming the Wills house with a video camera. The man quickly jumped into a goad Ford and drove off. The man was described as being in his mid-thirties, brown hair, and had a pot belly. It was almost certainly Mr. Cruel. A year and a half later, on July 3, 1990, in Canterbury, he would make his third attack. This time, he broke into a family home at around 11.30 p.m. Two sisters were fast asleep when one was awakened with a slight tapping on her forehead with a knife. The girl would see a man wearing a dark balaclava, gloves, and dark clothes. In addition to the knife, he was carrying a handgun. He demanded money, leading the sisters into their parents' Brian and Rosemary's bedroom. The pair were currently at a farewell party planned for their imminent return to England. He would search through Brian's wallet, but left $4,000 worth of traveler's checks inside. The sister would be hogtied with galvanized wire identical to clothesline wire. He would then lead his intended victim to the kitchen, where he went through her mother's purse. Then he cut the telephone cord and took the car keys to the family's rented car, before finally taking the victim to the bedroom, finding some different items of clothes for her, and told her to get dressed. He then seized other items of her clothing and put it in the bag to take with him. They then went back to where her sister was and asked the girls about their father's job, before telling the frightened girl that he was just abducting her sister to get $25,000. He said he would call her father the next morning for the ransom, which he never did. He then walked the victim out of her home. He jumped in the family's rented car, made the victim get down on the passenger side floor and duck her head, before driving a kilometer down the road and abandoning the vehicle. Most likely so his automobile would never be spotted near the victim's home. Brian and Rosemary would return just 20 minutes later to find the car stolen and the door open. They would find one daughter on the bed with her hands and feet tied, while the other was missing. Brian would say in an interview he was prepared to talk to the kidnapper and discuss the ransom, which he was prepared to pay. Mr. Cruel, though, was not really interested in the money. 
he made no effort to contact the anxious parents. Meanwhile, back at his hideaway, he would remove the tape from the victim's eyes and replace it with cotton eye pads, telling her, quote, keep your eyes shut if you want to stay alive, end quote. She would later be sexually assaulted before being leashed to a bed, either around her ankle or her neck, depending on the source you read. He would then reach over to the radio, which he let play almost continuously, turned it off, and went to sleep next to her. He awoke later that Wednesday around 10 a.m. and dressed her in a school dress, telling her he had a schoolgirl fantasy and that he followed her home from school, while also saying, quote, You will get home. You will be home by late Thursday evening, early Friday morning, end quote. After another day of sexual assaults, he would tie her feet up and leave. When he returned around 5 p.m., he told her he had been out with a friend looking for a suitable place to drop her off. No doubt this other person didn't exist. He would also pretend to be talking to this other person, but no one ever responded. Eventually, he would make the victim stand on a sheet while brushing her teeth and then taking a bath. Before they left, he told her, quote, You will be taken to a hospital, and they will test you. You will be examined by a police surgeon. They'll be looking for evidence to link me to you, and they won't find anything. End quote. He knew the exact police procedure. The car once again would have problems trying to start up, and he explained that the car was stolen by his friend. It's possible that he was worried about her relaying this to investigators, who would then have a second account of him driving an old vehicle. Fifty hours after the break-in, he would get her out of the vehicle, took the sheet off her, and then walked about five minutes along a footpath. He then removed her eye tape and gave her a change of clothes. But something must have spooked him, because he told her to stop, and then they walked a further three minutes. Finally deciding to drop her off at an electricity substation in Kew, about five kilometers from her home. It was just before 2 a.m. on her 14th birthday. Detectives would meet up with the victim soon and tried to find out as much as they could about the culprit. She stated that Mr. Krull was aware of her father's offer to pay him $25,000, the equivalent of $56,000 today, but he told her he wasn't interested. In fact, Mr. Krull would even ask her, quote, Do you think you're worth $25,000? There was one key clue that came out of this abduction, though. The victim reported that she had heard low-flying planes over the house, something that victim one had also mentioned. They were now super confident he lived pretty close to the airport. But there would actually be a series of interesting clues that came out of this kidnapping. One goes back to the balaclava. It's been erroneously reported that it was always black. But this is far from the case, as the first two were a blue mask. But this time he switched to a dark green one, and it also appeared to be homemade. This was particularly intriguing because in the early 90s, knitting was largely a woman's activity, even more so than now, leading early investigators into thinking that it was made by a loved one and given to him, perhaps a wife or girlfriend, or even his mother. Yet after all these years, no one ever came forward. So does that mean he made it himself? And if so, where did he pick up the skill? This actually lent credence to the thought that he might be an ex-con as it was common practice at the time for convicts to learn some type of skill in prison, such as textiles or knitting, add in his burglary skills. And well, the theory that he was in prison before just kind of adds up. Now investigators were sure they were looking for someone that had done time for breaking and entering. The second major clue to come from this abduction was the victim said that he had slept in until 10 a.m. both mornings, and that he also went back to sleep after 11 a.m. after one of the assaults. And although it's not always the case, it tends to be more likely that younger people sleep in longer. Could this have been an indication that the man was in his 20s, instead of the often reported statement that he was in his 30s to late 40s? Or was it possibly that the older man had a night shift job? Or was he just a night owl? There's also a mystery caller that comes in after this kidnapping. From July 6th to July 8th, just a couple of days after victim 3's ordeal, a man would call forensic psychologist N. Joblin three times. He would describe things that only victim three and the police knew about the abduction. He would also tell the psychologist about two other similar abductions, although he never stated names, and spoke in great detail about where victim three was taken, what she had eaten. This lead has never been publicly discussed by the police, so it's hard to say if it was ruled out as a hoax 
or if they believe it was the real suspect and they had chose to sit on the info. There is one final case that's always been contested, as far as if it relates to Mr. Krull or not, and we'll discuss why later. But for the most part, the majority of detectives do agree that the case marks the end of the canonical four cases involving Mr. Krull. On April 13th, 1991, in Templestown, Carmen Chan was babysitting her sisters Carly and Karen while her parents were working at a Chinese restaurant they managed. Carmen and her sister Carly had been watching TV when they decided to head to the kitchen and get something to eat during a commercial break. They were confronted by Mr. Krull, who was carrying a knife. He grabbed them by the hair and said, quote, where's your mom and dad, end quote, and forced them back to the bedroom. He bound and gagged the younger sisters and shut them in a cupboard. He told them, quote, you two little ones get in the cupboard and I won't hurt you, end quote. Then holding Carmen by the hair, pushed a bed against the cupboard trapping the girls inside. The sisters reported hearing Carmen say, quote, don't do that, end quote, as she was taken away. Carly and Karen were able to free themselves after about 10 minutes, and they called their father, who called the police. Sniffer dogs were used and picked up Carmen's scent. They traced it through the kitchen sliding door, through the garden to a gate at the tennis court, across the court, through a second gate at a side fence, and then continued down the street down to a vacant block where the scent disappeared, more than likely where Mr. Krull's car awaited. Again, he left red herrings. He would spray paint Mrs. Chan's late model Toyota Camry with the words, quote, more and more to come, end quote. Along with the driver's side, he put, quote, payback, Asian drug dealer, end quote. Police for their part would investigate to see if there were any drug connections, but there weren't any. Investigations would begin, and police found that weeks ago someone reported a man sitting in a sedan at the bus stop opposite the Chan's house on successive mornings which fits the M.O. of Mr. Krull's long-drawn-out planning. They would also find that just two weeks before the abduction, a tradesman of some type mysteriously appeared at the Chan's door, looking for work. And this, too, sounds like a play from Mr. Krull's handbook, although no one knows for sure if it was related or not. It was certainly far more common in the early 90s for tradesmen to go door-to-door -door looking for work, as the internet wasn't widely available yet. Finally, one last note of interest about this case. The Chans lived in a nice area with big homes. They had a six and a half foot fence surrounding the property, along with an electric gate and security systems. And days heading up to the intrusion, the Chans had disabled the security alarm system. Some reports have no explanation as to why. Other sources seem to believe that a pet cat kept setting it off, leading to the family's decision to turn it off. It's also worth noting that although every door in the home was unlocked, the offender chose to break in through a window, so perhaps he thought the alarms for the door were still on. Sadly, just a year later, Carmen would be found deceased at Edgar's Creek in Thomastown by a man walking his dog. She was at the rear of an electricity substation. She had three gunshots to the head. It appeared that she had been there for about a year, or more simply put, was probably murdered the night of the abduction. And going back to that night, it was reported that around 11 p.m. on Elizabeth Street, in North Coburg. A man walking along Edgar's Creek claimed he heard a gunshot. He looked up and saw a man wearing overalls and a rain jacket. He was standing next to a utility coupe vehicle. He had his back turned and the gun up in the air. It is unclear when this witness testimony was reported to authorities. It is also unclear if it was even related to Carmen's murder. The owner of the home overlooking the area where Carmen's remains were found would be interviewed. He said he remembered a day about a year ago that he seen a man with a rain jacket digging beside a parked truck where Carmen's body was found. He said he could not be sure what day it was since it had happened close to a year ago. Investigators have always been clear that they don't know for sure that it was Mr. Krull and that they have kept an open mind to the fact that it could have been an unrelated crime but feel that it was most likely perpetrated by him. The biggest difference between this crime and the other three was obviously Chan ended up murdered. So why was she the only one murdered? Police believe they know the answer to that as well. Carmen's mother stated that one day when news coverage of the third abduction was being broadcasted, Carmen told her mother if she was ever targeted, she would not go willingly. Because of this, police believe she put up a fight with the abductor. And it's very possible, sometime between leaving there and going back to the abductor's home, she was able to pull his balaclava off or was able to uncover her eyes to see the location of where she was being taken, and Mr. Krull felt that he had to kill her. 
although it's just as possible that Chan's fighting back just could have caused the abductor to snap. Another key difference was the fact that Mr. Krull didn't bother to take any of Carmen's clothes, like he did in the previous cases, as well as no mention of a gun or any type of a restraints. Also, the execution-style murder did bear similarities with a gang hit, along with the graffiti on the car could have meant it was totally unrelated to Mr. Krull. But police exhaustively investigated John and Phyllis Chan, and they could find no connection. In fact, they would go on to say the family was, quote, squeaky clean, end quote. But in spite of the fact that some things didn't exactly fit the past assaults, there were things that happened in Carmen's abduction that fit his M.O., such as the thorough planning, the hitting of the place after the parents left, going in through a window instead of an unlocked door that he possibly thought had an alarm on it, the forcing of the sisters into a cupboard, the fact that the attack happened just as the task force announced that the investigation was winding down, the graffiti placed on cars to divert police attention towards gang violence, then there's also the possibility that the man was watching at the school bus stop, or that he was the tradesman that showed up looking for work. All these point towards it being the same man. And we start with something that we hear in so many other cases. The initial investigation was botched. Mr. Krull was already hard enough to catch because of his strict cleaning up after his crimes, but according to Commander David Sprague, the crime scene at the Chans was, quote, it was a disaster with people stomping all over the place. They didn't seal the crime scene off as they should have, end quote. He would also state later that the commanding officer set up the command post in the home where Chan's abduction took place, further contaminating the crime scene. Investigations on the case have been going on for 35 years now, and the police have never publicly named a suspect or person of interest. But over the years, detectives have built a solid theory around the man and the crimes, they are very confident that he videotaped and took photographs of his attacks. They are also very confident, if he is still alive, that he almost assuredly is trading the pictures and videos online, while also collecting new disgusting material, even possibly using online communications such as chat lines or social media to solicit minors. It's also believed that he was indeed responsible for multiple attacks before the so-called Mr. Cruel crimes. There are at least 11 assaults before these four, with similar MOs that police are confident he is linked to, although they estimate there are more that they don't know about or haven't connected yet. The ones known about span from February 1985 to sometime into 1987. His target age range was speculated to be between 10 and 14 year old girls. However, that's not always been the case, as police believe he was responsible for attacks on at least three different women in their 30s, as well as a 14 year old boy. The latter happened on an unknown date in July 1985, when the boy was abducted from his Hampton home about 8.25 p.m. He was taken to an unknown residence and imprisoned for just over three hours, and was sexually assaulted. He was released around 11.45 p.m. The three cases then involved the older women. The home was broken into with a man wearing a balaclava or hood, carrying a sawed-off shotgun or pistol, would then blindfold, bound, and gag the women before sexually assaulting them. Again fitting the Elmo. The other seven attacks have very little info available. Investigators also speculated that he started with minor crimes, such as public indecency or voyeurism. He is also thought to be highly intelligent and spent a lot of painstaking hours planning his crimes. It is thought that he conducted surveillance on the victims and their families before the abductions were staged. He was also super careful to leave no forensic traces, which was very odd considering this was the mid-80s the infancy of DNA evidence. He protected his identity by covering his face at all times, except for the first victim. He also left red herrings to divert family and police attention. He was soft-spoken, calm, never in a hurry. He would bathe his victims carefully, with one victim describing the act as, quote, like a mother washing a baby, end quote. In two cases, he took a second set of clothes from the girls' home to dress them in before they were freed. He would threaten to injure the victims or family members with a knife or handgun if anyone disobeyed his orders. The FBI was asked to make a profile of the man they believed could be connected to the crimes. They were, however, given some incorrect data by the Australian authorities, who mistakenly told the FBI that all the break-ins occurred during school holidays. That was untrue. Most of them were, but not all of them. Regardless, the FBI said the following, quote, In view of the fact that these incidents all occurred during school holidays, we suggest there is a high degree of probability that the offender is involved with the school. He may be an employee there, 
or connected with the school in some other capacity. The offender has an intense interest in children, especially children in the age group that he is assaulting. He will spend a great deal of time with these children in what appears to be selfless dedication to students. The apparent dedication may well have earned him recognition and awards, such as Teacher of the Year, Coach of the Year, Exceptional Volunteer, etc. He is a functional individual, one with steady employment, is generally regarded as a good neighbor, polite, quiet, somewhat introverted. He may be involved in a certain community-minded projects. End quote. Investigators put out other theories as well. Many insisted that he was probably not a teacher, but someone involved in a skilled trade, maybe an electrician, which was an early theory that detectives leaned hard into. Both Carmen and Victim 3 were dumped right next to an electrical substation. Three of the victims lived within six minutes of an electrical substation. One of the victims was also right next to a large pylon carrying overhead transmission lines. There was also the account of the man filming the Wills residence six weeks before he broke in. The area where he was recording from was a piece of land that a substation was on, which seemed to add evidence that perhaps the offender was a linesman working for the State Electricity Commission of Victoria. Investigators would interrogate numerous linemen, but came up with nothing. Another theory floated about was that he was a real estate agent, with the possibility that he was getting keys to homes that were on the market for six to eight months at a time, which coincidentally is about the same amount of time in between each assault. He would also give him an open home where no one would be. A physical description was hard to come by because he was always wearing a mask, but it's believed he was between the ages of 35 to late 40 at the time of the crime, meaning he would be 70 to 85 today. He also had a slight build. His hair was either sandy or ginger colored. He was clean shaven and spoke softly, and according to police, quote, quite caring in his own monstrous way, end quote. Inspector Sprague also said, quote, it could just as well be a policeman who is working now it could be a former policeman. It could also be a solicitor or a barrister, or it could be somebody who is well-read in forensic medicine, end quote. By May 1991, just a month after the last official attack, Spectrum Task Force was established with the objective of capturing Mr. Krull. They would end up searching 30,000 homes and interviewing 27,000 suspects while working through 10,500 tips from the public. It cost around $4 million, or roughly $8.5 million today. They would also fly to the UK and to the US to conduct interviews with persons of interest there. A reward of $300,000 would be offered by law enforcement for any information that could lead to the conviction of Mr. Krull. Reward posters were distributed in 1991 to all Victorian homes and in certain areas of Southern Australia and New South Wales. There were also huge posters placed in public places. They would also investigate the earlier crimes that took place from 1985 to 1987 but they were unable to locate some witness statements and crime scene evidence, including tape and rope that was used to tie up a victim. The head of the Spectrum Task Force, David Sprague, stated that some of the evidence had never been examined by forensics, and that a lot of them had been lost or thrown out. The reports of these crimes are very hazy to say the least, but by 2019, retired detective Chris O'Connor spoke to a television crew for a documentary and would finally release two details that had never been heard by the public and that was that they were, quote, broadly speaking, perhaps up to a dozen, end quote, victims for the investigation, and that the first known victim was a 14-year-old girl abducted from her home in Hampton in February 1985, just two years before the first official case attributed to Mr. Krull. She was tied, gagged, and blindfolded before being driven to a vacant building site and assaulted. She was then dropped off nearby several hours after being kidnapped. During the assault, the attacker told the victim, quote, my liberty, my freedom is more important than your life, end quote. He also stated that an intimate swab was taken from the victim. However, any findings have never been released. By January 1994, the task force disbanded after eliminating 27,000 suspects. 16 years later, on December 14, 2010, police announced that an Apollo task force had been established some eight months earlier to follow a new lead in the case. The task force reviewed the original Spectrum task force investigation material along with some new leads that had surfaced in the previous year or so. The investigation, too, would end up being disbanded in June 2013 when they found out the new evidence was not credible and they were able to rule out a suspect. Three years later, on April 9, 2016, the Herald Sun would publish details from the original Spectrum Task Force. This included dossiers on seven suspects, which was unknown to the public at that time, known as the Sierra Files. They were produced with assistance from the United States FBI, and have never been released publicly. 
A small number of senior police and elite squads were given access to the Sierra files with the instruction that if another child was abducted, all seven should be arrested and questioned immediately. The research suggested that all seven could be Mr. Krull and that all of them had the necessary traits to commit the crimes Mr. Krull was responsible for. A few days later on the 25th anniversary of Chan's murder, police increased the reward money for information up to $1 million. Assistant Commissioner Stephen Fontana said in 2016 they believe Mr. Krull was still alive. However, he did state it was just speculation. It's also believed that he possibly stopped the crimes because he was one of the thousands of people interviewed in connection with the case, or because the murder of Chan affected him. Since the early days of the investigation, 27,000 persons of interest were eliminated down to 20, then to 7. And although Sierra Files lists 7 men as potentially being the suspect, one has the clear lead. And that is Dr. Brian Allen Elkner. And just how do we know he made the Sierra Files? Well, Elkner told us himself. In the interview in 2016, he would state that he knew he was on the Sierra Files and that he was the prime suspect. Of course, he wouldn't be the first person to ever try to insert himself into an infamous crime. But there's actually a lot of evidence that points to him. For one, he did teach at a high school. He also gave lectures at a local university which was exactly what the FBI predicted when they did the background assessment of the potential suspect. Elkner moved to Hampton in 1972. In between April 1972 and May 1974, he attacked six girls in their homes. Five of the girls were teenagers, while another was a younger woman. He tied all of them up and threatened them with a knife. He would be captured and sentenced to 10 years in 1974. However, he would be released early. Even after psychiatrists told the court that they did not have hope that he could be cured, he was released in 1979. He would move back to Hampton, where two of Mr. Krull's earliest suspected attacks took place in 1985. He would eventually move to Thornbury, and it's here that police searched his home. They actually found a knife and a balaclava hidden in the roof. He would be questioned for 12 hours by the Operation Spectrum Task Force. In at least one of the crimes, he would state that he was at his brother's wedding. I could not find if his alibi ever checked out or not. But former task force leader David Sprague has said that Elkner is more likely than anyone else to be Mr. Krull. We know little to nothing about the other men in the Sierra Files. Strangely enough, the police did officially give the names to the son, though, with the promise that they never leaked the names, which they haven't. But the journalists have tried to interview the men. This is how we know about Elkner. Details about the other men are sparse. We do know the age range of the men at the time of the attacks was from 28 to 39, which matches the victim statements. As for the others, here's what we know. Suspect number two is now 72 and lives in Canada. Suspect three is now 74 and has changed his name a few times since the crimes. He ran a journalist off his property when asked about being on the Sierra Files. Suspect four is 63 and lives in the area still. Suspect 5 was a tradesman and died in 2015. Suspect 6 is 67 and agreed to talk with a journalist so long as his name was kept confidential. He said, quote, I've never had any charges laid against me. I've been interviewed, yes, along with 27,000 other people. I was interviewed and that was it, end quote. Suspect 7 is presumed dead or living off the grid as the journalist from The Sun was never able to find him. Incidentally, a website called Melbourne Marvels, which has just a massive amount of research about the case, has potentially linked number seven to a man named Christopher Crowther. On September 5th, 1992, The Age published an article about a man that was sentenced to 16 years for attacks against six underage persons. He was 44 in 1992 and was a resident of Glen Iris, which matched number seven's leaked details. One key thing with Crowther, though, was he was in jail during Carmen's abduction and murder which is why investigators have never conclusively linked Carmen to the Mr. Krull case. It's just possible Crowther was Mr. Krull and Carmen was not even connected. More importantly, it shined light on something else. Why Mr. Krull stopped. The judge ordered Crowther to serve 13 years of his sentence, which would have kept him until 2005. However, Crowther died in 2003, which would explain why the attack stopped cold after 1991, which is unusual for someone that commits these types of crimes. Another suspect briefly considered was Robert Keith Knight, a notorious predator. 
He was charged in 1996 for abducting and sexual assault of a 12 year old in 1980 and 1996. His attacks were sort of similar as he held the 96 victim for up to 16 hours. He took photos with a tripod and made the girl take a bath. He was a youth worker like the FBI predicted. He had ties to a location under a flight path. But there were also differences such as he drugged his victims. He also didn't hide his face. He would eventually get out of prison only to be immediately arrested again for downloading some disgusting material online. He would then commit suicide shortly after. And while the Spectrum Task Force has said they cannot officially rule him out, they are fairly confident he was not Mr. Cruel. There is one more fanciful suspect to discuss. And I only bring him up because we just don't know a lot of the suspects. Plus this story is rather crazy. Norman Lee was a legendary armed robber that participated in the Great Bookie robbery of 1976 where a six-man gang stole 14 to 16 million, around 75 million in today's money, from bookmakers and Victoria Club. The money was never recovered, and Lee would be charged, but he was later acquitted. By 1992, Lee was the only surviving member of the six-man gang. He would try to pull off a heist at Melbourne Airport and was shot dead by authorities. Now how does this tie into Mr. Cruel? Ron Idles is dubbed as Australia's greatest detective with a 99% conviction rate. He spoke to a true crime podcast in 2022 and revealed that a well-known crook was dying of cancer in 2003 and asked to speak to the detective. This man was criminal slash police informant Alfred Hugh Gay. He made a deathbed confession that Norman Lee was indeed Mr. Cruel. He gave a description of the home Lee was taking the victims back to that matched witness statements. He was also near an airport and in the area of the flight paths that they had long suspected the home to be. He also stated that it was not a bedroom, instead it was a garage that had been converted by Lee. It is worth noting, Lee was shot dead at the airport almost three months after Carmen was found. But to me, I find this one a little out there, for one major reason. It almost feels like it's being pushed for the sake of a good story. One of the most notorious outlaws, the best detective in Australia, the largest unsolved crime in Australian history, it's a lot like every other year when a new Jack the Ripper suspect emerges and he was a prince or something, or some off-the-wall D.B. Cooper suspect that is now considered. It sounds too much like a Hollywood script. With that being said, there is one link. During the airport heist attempt, Lee was there with another man named Stephen Aisling. Once Lee was shot, Aisling tried to escape, but was captured. Years later in 2004, he would murder another man, and the body, well, he tried to bury that on the same patch of land where Carmen Chan was laid at. That's one hell of a coincidence. I'm sorry this video was so long without much resolution or even many suspects. The police haven't released much of any info, assuming they have much to begin with. The crimes for all intents and purposes were almost perfect. The possible contaminated parts like the rope and tape were lost due to police ineptness. The crime scene at the Chan's was destroyed. We have seven top suspects but only one is known by the public. It's also worth noting that investigators have said they can't rule out that he fled the country, or perhaps he committed suicide, or he just passed away. They just don't know. My two sources of info for this video comes from two websites. The first is whoismrcruel.com. This site has a great summary of each attack and suspects and breaks it down pretty quick. If you want a more in-depth read, go to melbournemarvels.com. But beware, this is a huge rabbit hole. The author of this site has done an incredible job scooping up newspaper clippings and data about the case from when they were first committed. The author also takes time to try and straighten out all the inconsistencies in the reporting of the case. That is all for now, but I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Do you think this case will ever be solved? Do you think Mr. Cruel is still alive? If you enjoyed the content, please leave a like and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it.